Fantastic to have you here, because we're making great progress on our rapier sword. We're getting this thing straight. I have been grinding and grinding and grinding and grinding and measuring and measuring and measuring. I've been taking my calipers. I'm taking measurements every two inches, the whole way down, to make sure that all the way down the piece, we are as consistently tapering as possible. I have spent so much time looking down the edge of this, making sure that as I grind, Indeed, we are grinding it into straightness, grinding out all the warps that we can. I have been obsessing over the straightness of this blade. And ladies and gentlemen, this is going to be a hell of a piece. I'm going to let this cool down for a second. We're at 36 grit. And I think we can now move up to 60 grit. This thing's looking really nice. Our edge most of the way down is at about 25 thousandths. Now, I have a sneaking suspicion that a number of you might be asking yourselves, well, Alec, didn't you just spend a boatload of money on a surface grinder? And doesn't a surface grinder make things flat? And aren't you concerned about things being flat right now? I am concerned about things being flat. But it's not as simple as just throwing it on a surface grinder and flattening it, because we have a warp to it, and what happens when you throw something on a surface grinder, not a, ignoring the fact that it doesn't fit on the surface grinder, but say this has a bend in it, I then turn on the magnet, well guess what, the bend goes away. Yeah, oh, great, the bend goes away. I, I, why didn't I think of that earlier? <laughs> This is why I didn't think of it earlier, of course, because the stresses in the steel or the, the memory of the steel means that you grind it and it's flat to when it's bent straight, but then you remove the magnet and it's then just going to bend right back to where it was warped in the first place. And so there's really no use for this anyway, which is very, very sad because I wish I could use the surface grinder. Just so you can better understand what I'm talking about, I got a piece of, uh, piece of thin copper sheet there and a piece of steel. We're going to jack it up on one end with the copper and turn on the magnet. See how much that moved? Magnet off, magnet on. And so sadly, because we can't apply stresses to the material to hold it flat, to then grind, it's one of those things where for us to be able to hold it, we'd need to apply a, a degree of pressure to it. But applying a degree of pressure to it, referencing a flat surface, means that we're going to tension it to make it flat, which means that we can't flatten it. It's the same we can't flatten it in a mill, we can't flatten it on the surface grinder. The only thing that we can do is do it by hand and do it by eye because we're able to grip it securely with our hands without... It basically just means that we can only do it by using our eye and our hands as, uh, as the tools to do it, which is super, super duper difficult. I say only as if like the way that I'm doing it is the only way to do it. I don't know. There are probably guys that do this every day that know a much better way of getting these things straight. But uh, my modus operandi right now is any sort of straightening that I can do at the bench. You saw me describe a little bit at the end of yesterday's episode. I'm going to do that. And aside from that, I'm just going to have to grind it into the best straightness possible. Perfect straightness is completely impossible. There is only straightness to within a certain degree of tolerance. And uh, right now, it really is looking rather fantastic compared to what it was just a few hours ago when I started today. So here, let me show you the straightness that we got right now. Now, it's difficult to see with the camera because the aperture of the camera is very different to the, uh, to the aperture of your eye in terms of how it affects your depth of focus. So it's very difficult to, uh, to be able to look down it all the way. But you'll see the tip comes out to the left of the screen slightly. It then bows to the right, comes back to the left slightly over at the end. And the tang has a slight kink that way. If we flip it over, it should show the opposite. And you can see by looking down the end of it, we're giving a foreshortening effect, I believe is the term, which means that we're able to really exaggerate any of the bends to spot them. Again, it curves in this way, and that just keeps going ever so slightly all the way up the blade. However, when we rest the blade, 
laid on a flat table under its own gravity. We see a smidge of air underneath there, just the tiniest smidge. That's an issue with the thickness there, which I didn't get right. If we flip it over, we see a little bit of air here, a little bit of air there, and you'll see that the tip sits about an eighth of an inch higher. The great thing is, is that of course, because this is a pretty flat surface, we can indeed measure that discrepancy and I can share that with you. Right, at the quarter inch in from the tip, let's say, four millimeters, turn it over, not quite an eighth of an inch difference, 5.5 millimeters. So 1.5 millimeters difference, 60 thou difference in the straightness of the piece over a, ow, my knee. Getting up there, I rammed my knee into the side of the, side of the leg. So 60 thou difference over 42 inches up to, where the, uh, up to where the tang starts back here. You know, the sharpened bit is gonna be about 38 and a half inches. So it's over a meter. You know, it's uh, a meter and six centimeters. One and a half millimeters of bend of bow, like its own gravity is gonna probably affect that more. You know, just, yeah, it's gonna affect it a lot more based on simply how it's held. So 60 thou over 42 inches. I'm sure there are thousands of people in the world today that can do much better than that. And historically, tens of thousands of people that can, but I'm gonna call that satisfactory because there is indeed a great danger with being a perfectionist in that you can really get bogged down and not get anything done. I've just spent hours in there obsessing over every single little bit I can find, trying my best to make it as good as possible. Right now, I think it's time to accept that we have a pretty decent baseline of straightness, which means that now I'm going to concern about getting edge consistency and finish consistency across the whole piece. So we're gonna be moving to 60 grit and then to 120 and then on from there. I will also say one little thing, actually no, Let's, let's do some grinding, then I'm gonna talk a little bit more about grinding. So what I've done is I've taken a Sharpie and I've marked all four bevels so I don't lose track of where I'm going and I'm gonna try and take even passes on all four bevels so that we can work from our current straightness, continue on evenly removing material from that. Coming up towards the tip, that angle changes slightly as I get towards the tip. Because it's so narrow, I wanna make sure that I don't remove too much width, so I'm tilting over further as I come towards it. Now I'm gonna turn 180 degrees to the last side, and we'll take another pass. You see, when I approach the grinding, uh, the grinding belt, I come on gently first, so that if I'm at the wrong angle, I don't do too much damage. Gentle pressure, feel for the full bevel, then apply heavy pressure, work my way through. Nice, long, consistent path, creating a nice bevel. Take another grip, find it, feel it. Pressure, pressure, pressure. Work my way through. Come up here towards the edge, to the end, pardon me. Change the angle, there we go. See, I haven't quite hit the bevel properly here. Here we go, a little better. Now, take the Sharpie again. Mark our bevels. Now I'm gonna look straight down and see if there are any inconsistencies and see if I need to apply more pressure at one spot versus another. I don't, we're good. So gentle pressure, then hard pressure. Make sure my bevels are looking good. They're looking good. Gentle pressure, hard pressure. Work my way up, keep a consistent edge thickness, keep a nice bevel, and work all the way up towards the edge. And we got some more work to do. So let's go ahead and run a time lapse. So now I'm working on swooping in here at the plunge line. I've got my uh, carbide file guide made by 7K Metalworks. I've got it tightened up. I pulled the belt over about three eighths of an inch. I'm gonna find my angle, come in, and work that swoop. And there we go. That's how that swoop gets in there. Check it out, we are at 60 grit. 
and we are looking mighty fine. This thing is looking wonderfully straight. We've been able to grind out a lot of the outer straightness and when we measure it, at the tip at least, we're now only out 20 thousandths of an inch. And we have gotten out almost all, I can't see any, any air. So somehow we have got it a lot straighter. Now I'm going 120 grit. We're gonna keep cracking on. Okay, I think we're good for 120 grit. So now we are gonna switch on over to a 240. I'm gonna pull that belt over. That way as we come into our Ricasso, it rolls over and gets that nice swoop continuing on. Righty-ho, so the blade itself is at a 400 grit or so. It's looking lovely. As you guys have been saying in previous episodes, the rapier does, in need, it does indeed still need to be rather thick. So I'm pleased that I left a pretty good deal of material on there. Uh, we're about seven and a half. Let me measure it. How about we use our uh, fancy new calipers Starrett sent me. Thank you very much, Starrett. These things are so much nicer than the other ones. 7.8 millimeters, 300 thousandths uh, here, at the, uh, here at the base of the blade, 260 thousandths at the middle, 170 thousandths at the, at the tip here. So it's four and a half millimeters at the tip, 6.7 millimeters in the middle, and as I said, uh, 8.7 millimeters here at the base. So we've left a pretty decent amount of thickness. Of course, there is still a good deal of flex in it though, so making another one, I'd probably leave it even thicker. But that's fine. What I've now done is I've blue dykumed up our tang. I danced in the morning when the world was begun, and I danced in the moon and the stars and the sun. I'm gonna line this ruler up with our blade center here. Then we'll give her a scribe all the way down the tang. It would appear the tang is indeed off center a little bit by about an eighth of an inch here at the back. So our scribe line is running further down this way than that way. And so we're gonna have to uh, do some fixing of that in the grind, but I think we're gonna be okay. I think we're gonna be able to deal with that. We've got plenty of material to work with. I'll do the other side too. And that does not add up. That does not make sense. We've got a problem. I gotta think about this. Okie dokie, so I've been using my height gauge here on this table, relatively flat, certainly good enough for this. And uh, with the aid of one of these magnets here, I was able to stick this up, and we were able to take our measurements, and we were able to mark a center line, mark our edges. We now have something to grind to, to make our tang straight. So now we're going into the grinding room to do just that. No way, ha, Tony strikes again, I guess. Right, well, now we need to finish up the sides here. Wait. Again? Well, I'm not complaining. And by now, I'm sure you're familiar if you're a subscriber, which if you're not, you should be. There's the red button down below that you can hit. The next step is our scratch lines that are going in sideways need to go down the whole piece. Why? Because you get in what you put out from a project. I want to put a lot of effort in this because I want a lot out. I'm putting a lot of elbow grease in because I want a lot of grease out. Anyway, make sure to hit subscribe so that you can catch up with tomorrow's episode. Thank you so much for watching. Love hearing from you down below. Make sure to follow me on Instagram at Alex Steele for more behind the scenes. Been a pleasure. I'll see you tomorrow.